Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. I'm Gavin Shaw. Today, I'm joined by Wes Goldberg, the co-host of the Locked On Heat podcast to discuss the Miami perspective on the New York Knicks. Do they see us as a threat? Plus, how the team is responding to the Damian Lillard trade. How desperate are they to acquire a star after missing out on Lillard and expectations for the Knicks and Heat this season? All that and more right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, and today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more right now. New customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. All you have to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started and we want to thank you for making locked on Knicks your first listen today and every day because we're now available on all platforms that includes on youtube so if you want to become an everydayer on the video side of things be sure to hit that notifications bell and subscribe so you never ever miss an episode uh but who's talking to you i'm gavin shaw your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster and i want to remind you that it's all well and good if you watch the podcast five days a week. But if you want to take our relationship to the next level, you got to sign up for our subtext where we will text you our latest thoughts and uh, ruminations, maybe. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a stressful thing on, on, on the New York Knicks. Um, and you can text us as well, questions, um, and we will send you a bunch of answers. So without further ado, uh, this is this is one of, I guess it's still technically the off season. It's the very, very end of the off season. Uh, this is one of my favorite episodes we've recorded all off season. Wes is absolutely fantastic and uh, he has some good thoughts on the New York Knicks. They're pretty nice considering that he is coming from a Miami Heat podcast. So uh, without further ado, let's get into things with Wes Goldberg. All right, guys, as promised, lucky enough to be joined by the fantastic co-host of the Locked On Heat podcast and a co-host of one of our Locked On NBA shows, Wes Goldberg, who has every right to be very smug, did not get a chance to do a postmortem on last year's series. Congratulations. Big win for you guys. Congrats on getting to the finals. Um, and, and all that preceded a, a very interesting summer for the Miami Heat. So I, I hope you had a good one, Wes. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was good for business. The summer was, but ultimately the Heat didn't get what it is that they wanted out of it, uh, and so remains to be seen what happens uh, for the Heat this season. Well, uh, one of the teams they'll be in competition with now, maybe, and and you still could say based on recent results they are in a different tier, uh, but but maybe in a more similar tier now, um, the New York Knicks. Uh, mm. What what were your thoughts on New York after last season's playoff series? And I guess. Um, just coming into this season, do you see them as a threat to Miami or, or do you more so think, all right, it's Milwaukee, Boston, and it's us, the team that's made uh, two of the last four NBA finals? All right. Uh, a couple of different places I could start. The first place I, I probably shouldn't start here because it probably get me banned off of the Locked on Heat show. I really liked the Knicks last year. I liked that team last season. Um, I really appreciate in basketball when a team operates with clarity. And it didn't start that way with the Knicks. And I'm not telling your listeners anything that they don't know. But Tom Thibodeau finally figured out the rotation that makes sense. Nobody that can't play defense. If you can't play defense, you're not playing. And uh, and then just go from there. But that was like common denominator. You got to be able to D up. And if you can't do it, you're not going to play. And yeah, so you better, you better, you better be named or, Jalen Brunson, basically. Or you got, <laughs> yeah. But even Jalen Brunson, like, yeah, one-on-one, he's not a good defender. But he's a communicator out there. He's a leader. Like, that stuff does matter. You know what I mean? And so... Yeah, you got to contribute something. You got to be a value add on the defensive end. And I think everybody that was in the rotation pretty much was. And uh, and, and I, I just, like I said, I like clarity. I like when a team has an identity. I like when a team just knows who it is that, that they are. And then they just go for it. And you know what? They were never going to win the championship. And everybody knew that. But that wasn't really the point. And I think you guys have covered this a lot on Locked on Knicks. Like, that was never the goal. That was never really the point. Yeah. It was, hey, this team doesn't seem like a complete mess anymore. We kind of have an identity. We know who we are, and we have some clarity about not only who we are now, but what it is that we want to do going forward. And so um, seeing that playoff series uh, between the Heat and the Knicks, and I did get a chance, I think it was a regular season game, to go to Madison Square Garden and cover a Heat-Knicks game, the one where Tyler Hero almost uh, hit hit the – took the potential game winner and it missed, but the Knicks ended up winning that game. But uh, they're really physical. Uh, They're well-coached, and – I just think that their 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 floor is really really high, but their ceiling isn't that much different than their floor. Is sort of my takeaway 
from the Knicks. And I don't remember if you asked me other questions. And so yeah, ba- ba- basically, yeah. <laughs> um, um, do you? I maybe maybe you answered it in that in the, in the end of that. But do you see them as a threat to the Heat? Like this year? Would, would you like like if yeah. they met up in the playoffs again? Would it be a situation where like all right, we know how this goes. It's how it went last year. Would you say like all right, another year experience, another year of Jalen Brunson getting even better, fully healthy, Julius Randle, Emmanuel quickly could be a different series this time around. Uh, they're always a threat to the Heat. And the Heat are always a threat to the Knicks. And that's just the way the rivalry goes, right? Like, in the, we had the 90s. We're all, we've all been there. Like, uh, Jeff Van Gundy is rolling over in his media grave right now with us just even talking right now. We're not supposed to be talking. Like, sure. the Knicks and the Heat don't get along. And so because of that, these teams are always a threat to each other. I, I was surprised by how easily the Heat handled the Knicks in the playoffs. And I, act, and I mean that more as a compliment to the Knicks than anything else yeah. right like I, I i like i said last year i thought the knicks were really good i thought they were really physical and those are things that those are things that work well in the playoffs like i remember talking with draymond green a few years ago and he says um you know you've got 82 game players and you got 16 game players but you can also you know extrapolate that to teams you've got 82 game you have regular season teams and you have playoff teams and the things that tend to translate well in the postseason is physicality and there's a lot of other things but physicality is just one of those factors and the Knicks are a very physical team, um, but you know, obviously the Miami Heat were too. They ended up winning that series. But yeah, going forward, you know, because both teams are largely unchanged, I feel basically the same way, right? If if those teams met up in the playoffs again, or even the regular season, like they what 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 was it, Gavin? Was it was it one three? It was it was yeah, either three one or two one Knicks or two yeah. one. Yeah, the Knicks had the advantage in the regular season, and so that. That's why I was a little concerned going into that series in the playoffs. And I think it could go either way. But the, even those to that, that 2 1 Knicks advantage, like the point differential was like, was like 11 points or something. It was like nothing yeah. over the three games. So uh, these teams are very evenly matched. I felt that way last year and I feel that way this year. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair take, and I think I think it's funny that you said that it was it was easier than you thought, right? Because you go back to that series, and you you could you could look at it from the perspective, well, the Knicks were maybe two shots in the final minute away from getting Game Seven mm-hmm. at MSG, but I'm but I'm I'm with you. Like it didn't feel close throughout the series. It was to the point that my co-host Alex Wolf was like, I think after Game Four, he was like, all right, just end the series already. This is disgusting. Like, <laughs> I gotta, I don't want to watch more of this. Um, and th- there was a feeling that even though the Knicks were close, they were never that close. And it was kind of, right. I mean, I thought it was almost emblematic of how Jimmy Butler treats the regular season to some extent where I am going to exert the exact amount of talent and effort and ability that I need to win and to get through and not an inch or iota more than that. And, and that was kind of my feeling. But I also feel there, were, I mean, I, I noted it before, but it was to your point of physicality translating. It was interesting where, where the, this Knicks defense that was pretty mediocre in the regular season, all of a sudden was, was this dominant unit. I think they, they finished the playoffs. Maybe Miami was slightly ahead of them as, as with the top defensive rating. And this offense that was um, statistically one of the five best in NBA history um, did not translate at all to the playoffs. It was terrible. And, and again, quickly first being ineffective, then getting hurt was part of that. Randall playing on a bum ankle was part of that. But my, my big curiosity that we didn't really get to see answered was how much of this Knicks offense translates to the playoffs. And because of those injuries, the only part of it that really translated was Jalen Brunson. And against the Heat, it, it translated um, in a way that it was even better than the regular season. Yeah. Did that series change your perception of, of him as a player? Because I think yes. for people who are and, – and we had uh, the Athletics Fred Katz at a great – Quote on this the other day, but he put up 28 points the second half of the year. And obviously those last three games against the Heat, that was not like star stuff. That was superstar all NBA type stuff. Yeah, I actually thought that like we all remember when the Mavericks lost Jalen Brunson for nothing. And it was like, oh, my God, the world is over. And I was like, I don't know, like the guy had like a couple of good playoff series for you, but he wasn't like lighting the world on fire. It wasn't like this guy was getting voted into all star games when he was in Dallas. I thought people were kind of overstating it. I thought he was a fine player, but I wasn't like, yo, this guy's a dude with like a capital D. He's a dude with a capital D, man. Like that, like that, that stuff in the playoffs. Like you, once you do it two years in a row, I'm like, all right, now it's not a fluke anymore. Now it's just happening. And with two different teams playing two different roles, you know what I mean? For the most part, like he did it in Dallas with Luca out and he kind of played a similar thing. But s- still, I like Jalen Brunson is just one of those guys. I don't know how long his peak is going to last because he is a smaller guard and those things, but that's a kind of a different conversation. But right now, like that guy just shows up. I remember talking with the Heat players and I was like, you know, like, Yo, what's the deal? Like, why? Like, you guys are maybe the best defensive team in the NBA. Like, when all the chips are down, right? Like, defensive rating notwithstanding. Like, when the chips are down, you got Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, and I don't like. And and you guys might be the best defensive team in the league. 
what's going on with this dude? Like, you guys have no problem stopping Trey Young. You bottle up James Harden. Like, what's it with Jalen Brunson? Like, yo, like, and they, like, I guess if they would have had the answer, he wouldn't have been scoring like 40 points every night. They didn't really have an answer, Gavin. Like, they were just sort of like, yeah, man, like, you got to give him credit. He's crafty. He's wiggly, like, whatever their words were. But they really, like, to me, the takeaway was like, yo, they don't really know. And I think that's the thing with Jalen Brunson is you don't really know how he's doing it, but he's doing it. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of ways to sort of break that down. But I came away from the series to answer your question thinking really highly of Jalen Brunson. Like, I don't know that he could be the best guy on a championship team, but I know for sure he could be one of the best three guys on a championship team. And I didn't think that going into last season. Yeah, it, it uh, my perception certainly changed in that second round as well. Um, flipping to Miami, because you're, you're lucky enough to get to cover that team in person, talk to them all the time. What's the vibe around the team right now? And, mm. and it seems like, um, based on um, everything going on with Jimmy Butler, right, pretty confident and, and and deservedly so given their track record, given what they've done the last few years. But did it, it, is there going to be repercussions for a summer full of Dame and then not getting Dame beyond obviously not having him on the court for the Miami Heat? Yeah, you know, kind of the thing we talked about with the Knicks in terms of clarity. I don't know that the Heat have it, yeah. uh, which is interesting because this is the team that went to the finals, right? Mm-hmm. And you would think, and, and it's, it's a lot of the same roster, a lot has been made of them losing their backcourt, uh, Gabe Vincent and Max Struess. That wasn't really their starting backcourt to even start last year. They, their starting backcourt was Kyle Lowry and Tyler Hero, and that was one half of their starting backcourt to start the playoffs, and then Hero broke his hand, and then that became their starting backcourt to the finals. So it wasn't like they had this thing set in stone and they knew exactly what they were doing, and then and then they just went off to a finals run. Uh, they sort of backed into an AC and whatever. Uh, I'm recapping a lot of stuff there, but essentially I don't know that this team has that clarity uh, there's there's some debate going on right now in miami about who even starts at point guard is it going to be kyle lowry can you start him at point guard at 37 years old or do they just go with no real traditional point guard is it like just a tyler hero josh richardson backcourt and everybody just sort of handles the ball and gets into offense as as a group um so you have some of that for sure you have some just like the basketball x's and o's uncertainty that's hovering around the team the other part of it is that they like to call them trade rumors is not even fair. Like these were trade discussions. These were the legitimate things that are happening. And I will give credit to the Heat. They're not shying away from that stuff. They're like, yep, we tried to get Dame. We didn't get him. Like nobody's like blaming the media and doing that whole thing. Like it was like, yeah, we tried to get it. We didn't get him. We're moving on. You know, and, and Tyler Hero has done the same thing as well, uh, in terms of being involved in those in those trade discussions and having to come back and face his teammates and be part of this team and, and try to, you know, do something for himself in his own career and and try to win for his teammates that obviously were not the ones conducting those trade calls. So, look, I I think that has put a kind of a weird cloud over stuff in training camp, if if I'm being honest. I don't know that it's going to matter, right? This is also a team that kind of just takes this stuff and, and eats it and then creates fuel out of it, like and that they kind of thrive on those sort of things. But um, it's a little – it's I'm not going to lie, man. It's, it's, it's a little weird. I've been – I was at Media Day Monday – training camp uh tuesday and, and today on wednesday and I, it just feels like this team is they are excited for the season to start so that they can get away from all that trade stuff but like it's almost like the season can't start soon enough because they're still trying to figure out who it is that they are and you don't really figure that out until you start playing basketball all right guys next we are going to continue discussing how desperate should miami be to make a star trade in Do they actually have the assets to pull it off? But before we do that, I got to tell you about our buddies over at FanDuel. Snap into the action this NFL season and this NBA season with FanDuel America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 off in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel. There's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads player props, over-unders, and more. I am looking at those Eastern Conference over-unders, the Miami Heat, at 45 and a half. I think based on uh, some of what Wes is about to tell you in this podcast, I'm going to take a slight over on that. Miami has a great opportunity to be a better regular season team this year than they were last year. If you agree or disagree, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL and NBA season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. 
And, and I, I guess this is a question that would maybe further complicate everyone settling in, but, but what is the pressure at this point to still get a star trade done? I, I know you guys were talking about James Harden on the podcast the other day. And I, I, I think there does have to be an urgency here. As, as weird as that sounds again, for a team that won the East two, uh, two of the last four years was a last second. Jimmy Butler missed three away from making it three out of four years, but it, it does feel like they're, I mean, just from a talent perspective, once they get to the NBA finals, um, wh whatever magic and, and, and heat culture powers them through teams that on paper should beat them in the Eastern Conference. And it happens again and again. So you, you can't call it a fluke as much as um, people, myself included at times, like intuitively feel that way. Like obviously they have something, but they were clearly outclassed by Denver. Um, and the fact that yep. Jimmy is 34, obviously, and isn't getting any younger. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is what's the level of confidence that they actually have the ammunition to get that done for the right type of star after um, uh, with the extreme extenuating circumstances, not being able to do so with Portland and, and teams like the Knicks that are loading up on extra picks and assets, not to mention yeah. um, teams like the Thunder, the Rockets that can just blow the Knicks or the heat out of the water if they want to get involved in those talks that the heat can actually pull that trade off if they so desire to. I'm going to answer the second question first, because actually okay. the first part's more interesting. So the confidence has got, it, it's waning. It's got to yeah. be, not only did you strike out on Damian Lillard, you didn't really have a real offer for Drew Holiday, although I, I think that even the Heat were surprised what Drew Holiday ultimately went for uh, yeah. from Boston. Uh, Boston is a team acting with desperation, which is something we're about to get to here. But um, they struck out on Kevin Durant. You know, they struck out on Donovan Mitchell. Like these are like they have been chasing stars now for a couple of years at least to pair with Jimmy Butler, and they haven't gotten a single one of them. So the confidence is being shaken and not only and one of the reasons too it kind of goes back to Tyler Hero it's they I think there's this idea that the Heat are trying to get rid of Tyler Hero they're not they love they love Tyler Hero like the Heat adore Tyler Hero mm -hmm. they also want one of the you know they, they'd be they would love to add one of the top 75 players of all time whether it's Kevin Durant or Donovan or, or uh, uh, Damian Lillard and you have to you have to trade a really good player to get really good players right and so that's and they're not obviously going to trade Jimmy or Bam so it, the next like, Tyler is the guy, right? And he also plays, you know, he's a score first guy and those guys are score first guys, whatever. So um, the fact that they're in their mind, best asset isn't really good enough to even get them in the door for those guys has shaken the confidence in this front office's ability to, to get something like that done. So that's that, that's that answer in terms of the desperation. That's so interesting because you would look at a team like, yeah, you went to the conference, you know, you've been conference finals three of the last four years, NBA finals two of the last four years. You're this close. Like you should, and, and everybody says, if you're in the NBA finals, you got a chance to win the NBA finals. I didn't think they had a chance to win in those NBA finals. Like maybe in the bubble, because it was weird, but against the Nuggets, you had no, they had no chance. And I knew that going into that, right? They had no chance. The Denver Nuggets were a far superior team. Um, I, I think this team has a really clear ceiling. And it's NBA Finals, but it's not championship. And I don't, I don't really recall the last time I felt that way about any team, right? It's, it's so strange. But this team feels so confident when they go against the best teams in the Eastern Conference, Milwaukee and Boston. Like, they, have, they live rent-free in the Boston Celtics' head, right? They kind of live rent-free in the Milwaukee Bucks' collective headspace also, and so there's like a unique kind of competitive advantage that they have against those teams. And we'll see how that changes in Milwaukee with new leadership there. But um, I, I don't know. I just there's there's a clear acknowledgement that there's a ceiling there as well. I think that if, if you got this front office in an honest moment, they would be surprised that they made the NBA finals. They, this team did not expect that they were going to make the NBA finals. Jimmy Butler talks the talk and walks the walk and does all these things. But if you got these th that if you got Pat Riley in an honest moment, there's no way he expected that team to make the run that they did. Cause it's literally never happened before. So it can't be the expectation. So um, over the last couple of years, again, they can all say whatever it is that they want to say, but this team has been actively engaged in trade talks of trying to get a number one scoring option, a super duper star. That's what it is that they feel that they need. And they could say all the things like we get these undrafted guys and nobody ever counts us. Uh, everybody counts us out and we've got Jimmy Butler and we got all this and we've got, we believe in our team and all these things. They could say it to the press all they want. But behind the scenes, they have been desperately trying for two years now to add a super duper star. We're not talking about a team that's just sort of trying to improve on the margins, right? That's usually what happens when you talk about teams that are contenders. You look at a team like Boston. 
They're not looking for a super duper star. Just Drew Holiday, boop, pop him in. Kristaps Porzingis, boop, pop him in. Like just little things. A team that's desperate, like Milwaukee, to just hang on to their superstar and Giannis. You make that superstar trade. You do whatever it takes. You go get Dame to try to keep your core and your superstar in place. Miami is acting more like Milwaukee, even though they didn't get it done, and less like a team like Boston this year or even Philadelphia the year before that that just added a P.J. Tucker, added a DeAnthony Melton and whatever. They're holding on to whatever assets that they have because they're trying to make the superstar trade, and those little marginal moves that they could have made to improve their team over the last couple of years have just passed them by. They're not mm -hmm. making those moves because they don't think that they're actually that close, right? Because if you thought you were that close, you would just make the marginal moves. You wouldn't be making, you wouldn't be looking for the big splashy move. The Heat are acting like a team that are much further away from winning a championship than they've actually been the last few years, and I just find that interesting. Who who's the next guy in your mind? If it, assuming it's not Harden, or maybe maybe it is Harden. I think they should at least have the conversation about James Harden. I am out here in Miami, and I can't. I never got, I never thought in my career I would be here doing this. Yeah. At, like screaming from rooftops, just do it. Just trade for James Harden. And maybe I'm just like the stupid guy who doesn't yeah. really understand how basketball works or or all this stuff and I'm and maybe I'm just like super impatient. Maybe I just think it's going to be good for business and that's certainly part of it. But I don't I I, I don't see the risk. Like dude's on an expiring contract. He was really good last year. It only hmm. gets weird in the off seasons with James Harden. It doesn't really get weird in the season. Like you could say it was weird for a couple of weeks in Houston. That was basically an off season thing. It was just an extended off season for James Harden. Um, the Brooklyn thing is its own thing. Like that was a whole mess. So I just, I think like, all right, like you don't really even need to ever have an off season with the guy. The guy. It's already preseason now. Just go trade for him. Let him play ball. And then just walk away after a year. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Who cares? Then you just you get off scot free. He's not under contract anymore. Let him do whatever he wants. He can go sign with the Clippers next summer. Who cares? Like, I don't know. I just I think James Harden is out there and and probably gettable. I don't know that Philadelphia would trade him to Miami, a conference rival. I don't know what the the price would be ultimately. Like, I wouldn't. I don't know that I would give up a pick for James Harden. But if I can get him for like a Kyle Lowry and a, you know, a few, few other contracts, I would at least explore it. If I'm Miami, you got to have a meeting about it. And again, from my sense of things, I don't think that they're really entertaining it. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens in terms of after Harden, the Donovan Mitchell stuff is out there. And I think it's real. Like he, it's been reported. He already told the front office that he's not going to sign a contract extension. This could be very similar to when Paul George told Indiana's front office that he's not going to sign the extension. And they end up trading him to Oklahoma city. Right. Yeah. Like I, I could see that maybe being the case for the Cavs, although I think that they're really high on their own team and they might just want to play it out. But whatever. Donovan Mitchell is out there. Those would be the two names if I'm a Heat fan that I'm looking at. The Joel Embiid stuff, that's not really for Miami. That's more for your team. That's not that's not that's not for Miami. You already got Bam out of bio in place. And Joel Embiid is better than Bam, but Bam is like there's something to be said about just keeping your own guys, you know, yeah. and bam is your guy and just keep them and don't, don't overthink it. Just keep, keep your guy and let Embiid play somewhere else. It's fine. Um, so yeah, those two guys right now in the immediate term, James Harden, I'd at least be thinking about it. If you're trying to long-term plan, I'd be looking at Donovan Mitchell or medium-term plan. I'd be looking at Donovan Mitchell. And if I'm really long-term planning, then I guess Luka Doncic would be the guy, but that's like, you know, we're talking about three years from now, probably two or three years from now. All right, guys, we're going to come back with Wes one final time. Talk a little Tyler Hero, one young player that can stand out. And who's going to win the season series between the Knicks and the Heat? But before we do that, I want to tell you about our buddies over at Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs make you look good. Bird Dog stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and give your leg a truly sculpted look. And if my legs can look sculpted, anyone's legs can look sculpted. And they certainly do in Bird Dogs. Um, they're pretty cool because they, they kind of do the exact same thing as Lululemon. The, the difference is they just fit way better. In fact, they fit me better than any shorts I've ever purchased in my life. Because most shorts are made of this stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs is different. They fix the issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. The other cool thing is because sometimes I'll play basketball in them. They use anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day. The, the, the best part about them is the versatility. I mentioned I like to hoop on, in them. I don't mind going in a date on them. Um, you could also go out for dinner. You could go hang out by a pool. They are the single piece of clothing I have. I say, you know, I can I can wear these for pretty much any single occasion. So if you're with me and you want to join Bird Dogs Nation, go to birddogs.com slash lockdown XXX 
or enter promo code locked on XXX at checkout for a free Bird Dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on XXX for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. I promise you that. Yeah, because I I think the window of winning a championship with Jimmy Butler is the best player on your team. It, it might be this year. It might not even, to your, everything you just said, it might have never existed or it might have only existed in the bubble because the version of him we saw against the Bucks is that guy. And mm-hmm. if, if can he do that for four rounds, we almost didn't get to find out last year because he wasn't the same person after hurting his ankle against the Knicks. And, and I don't know if he would have been that same person anyways. Um, there's a world where he was. And I, I think that's the world where maybe with Nikola Jokic tweaking ankle or something like that's the world where Miami won a championship. I think you have two years. I think the window is two years. Yeah, I think the window yeah. like Jimmy Butler could be this dude, I think, for two more years. But the problem is you can't be that guy in the regular season. And right. he almost didn't make the playoffs last year. That yes, yeah, so that's that's where I wanted to go because I want to. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, so let's just say like Dame it. Dame was perfect in the sense that that is your co number one. It's almost the same way if the Knicks got Embiid, I would see that relationship where Embiid would almost be the Dame where he's the guy who's like the nominal best player, who's putting up the volume numbers in the regular season. Brunson's your closer for the Knicks. Jimmy, I mean, Dame can obviously do it too, but but Jimmy was ultimately going to be your closer, like the face, the heart and soul of the team of your friends. So in that sense, I think he could be the number one guy, but I think he needs someone who can almost provide fuel to the fire and get him to the spot where he can drive a dagger into your heart um, because it's, it's just a hard thing at 34 with, without a lot of help offensively, at least to sustain that series after series. But regular season, is Miami going to take it a little bit more seriously? Because to your point, you guys made the finals. Mm. You, you almost lost in the play-in as well. Both things are true. Um, are, are they okay towing that line again? They're just like, yeah, we're the Miami Heat. We're going to get through that. And then we're going to kick Milwaukee's butt or Boston's butt. Drew Holiday, Damian Lillard be damned. Or do they want to try and get an easier path this time around? That's interesting that you say take it seriously. I thought they took it seriously last year. They just weren't yeah. that good. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, this was a team two years ago. They were the number one seed in the East. And a big part of that was that they were the best three-point shooting team by percentage in the league. And that lifted them to a lot of wins. Last year, they were the worst three-point shooting team in the league and literally had the worst offense in the league of any team that was act- actively trying to win. So we're not including Houston and San Antonio. And like, take away the teams that were very obviously tanking. Of all the teams that were actually trying to win basketball games on a weekly basis, the Heat were the worst offense in the league. And a lot of par- and a big part of that was because their three-point shooting just plummeted. Like Everybody across the board had career really? lows. It was a weird outlier two years ago, and it was a weird outlier and I would venture to say a weirder outlier last season. If they could kind of find like a nice little comfort zone in the middle of best team in the league by three-point shooting percentage and worst team in the league by three-point shooting percentage, I think they'll win more basketball games and it would be less frustrating in the regular season because you watch those games and you're like, look, they're really good at creating open looks. Like Eric Spolster is a mastermind, right? Like he can figure out a way to get uh, an open look in, in a phone booth. You know what I mean? Like he can figure it out. But they were just missing those open looks. So I'm like, I don't know. Like, this team is executing well, but they can't shoot. So I don't know if this team's any good. If they can just make a decent clip of their three pointers that are open, I think things would be a lot less frustrating and the regular season can go a little bit more smoothly. So I, I expect them to be in the top six in the East. I expect them to not have to go through the play in tournament again this year. I think this team is deeper than it was last year. Uh, despite having losing, having lost Gabe Vincent and Max Struess, and a lot of people are saying, well, you lost those guys, so like you're not going to be as deep. Josh Richardson is a plug-and-play guy. Um, I think Kyle Lowry should be healthier this year because he's going to be under that minutes management probably that he wasn't at at the beginning of last year. Kevin Love, you have him for a full season. All of a sudden, you have a real traditional power forward. Caleb Martin now can come off the bench and play more of his traditional spot and fill in the gaps where he's needed, where he wasn't able to do that at the beginning of last year. You had a, pl- uh, a ready-to-play rookie like Jaime Jaquez Jr., uh, they're better at backup center with Thomas Bryant and Orlando Robinson than they were at the beginning of last year where they had Dwayne Dedman, who didn't even finish the season with the team. I think this team is much deeper than it was last season. I think they're going to shoot better than they did last regular season. So I think the regular season's going to be smoother sailing for them. Um, I don't think that they're going to be the the first or second seed. I think that's probably going to be Milwaukee and Boston in whatever order. But I think their ceiling is probably the number three seed. You know, I think that's very much in play, just as the number six seed is. I, I think like... You know, the, the Eastern Conference, and you know this, is very kind of mushy. I don't really know what to think of it. Uh, a lot of these teams are sort of in the same zone once you get past the top two. And so um, we'll see what happens. It could just come down to injuries and availability and things like that. Yeah, that is that is the exact range um, I had the New York Knicks in. Uh, what what yeah. are expectations for Tyler Hero? Um, because he seems like, like given that he's a young guy, very prideful dude, was very loudly in trade discussions all summer, like, 
outside looking in, tell me if this is off, but it seems like he's doing about as well with that psychologically as you could be. And is there room for him to make a jump this year? Because if I'm looking for a world where Miami's a lot better, it's because, oh, Tyler Hero, people forgot that he, despite the disrespect that he gets and and maybe um, some of the fair perception coming to the fact, well, Miami made that run without him. Like, he is a really good young player and he's ex- extraordinary talent offensively. Yeah. Like, can he make a leap and can he be the guy that um, kind of elevates Miami when, when they didn't necessarily get that star this summer? I expect him to be better this year than he was last year, but I thought he was really good last year, and I thought he was really good the year before that. This is a guy that scored 20 points per game over the last two seasons. You know, He's a reigning sixth man of the year. Um, He took that starting job and ran with it. He was one of the best clutch players in the NBA last year. People tend to forget that stuff. Um, Miami ran a lot of offense through Tyler Hero down the stretch. Like Towards the end of the regular season, they were just leaning into the Tyler Hero, Bam, out of bio pick and roll, and that was sort of their rinse and repeat offense uh, during the most successful part of their season, by the way. And so I do think that this summer people, if you, I, I don't think Tyler Hero was always sort of polarizing. Cause I don't know that a whole lot of people were watching the heat closely and certainly not watching him closely. He kind of has like that look and that reputation of just sort of being a score first. And he is a score first guy, but he's got great feel for the game. Uh, he's a really good decision maker. He's an elite three point shooter. I think he's still trying to figure out where it is that he fits in next to Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, but whatever like it's fine like he's been doing a really good job with it that's not new for nba teams so um i think his value has been really dragged this summer and i don't think it accurately reflects how good of a player he is and um and i think we're gonna see and one of the things that he does every year is he comes back and he adds a new thing and that's one of my favorite things when you see that from players is it's not because that's not the case with a lot of players a lot of players are just who they are tali hero is adding something to his game every single and I think that's a huge testament. I don't know how good that's going to make him ultimately, but I know he's a good player now. Um, in terms of his attitude, it's very much like I don't give a bleep. It's just, yeah. hey, like I don't even – one of the one of the reporters on Media Day was like, hey, like so there's – I'll try to make this as short as possible because I feel like I'm going long on these answers. But All right, good. Um, Tua Tagalavoa, Dolphins quarterback, for anybody on Lockdown Next who's not aware of that, was in trade rumors for Deshaun Watson two years ago. And one of the viral quotes that he gave when asked by a reporter, do you feel wanted by your organization, was, I don't not feel wanted. So one of the reporters <laughs> brought that up to Tyler Hero on Media Day. He's like, hey, Tua said this. And when he was kind of going through similar things, how do you feel? And Tyler Hero knew exactly what this reporter was doing. He was baiting him into saying the thing that he wanted him to say, and it was fine. And I have no problem with the reporter doing that, by the way. That's just That's just... That's the game, dude. Doing your doing sure. your thing. Yeah. But Talier just gave him what he wanted. And I don't know that he would have done it before. I think in before, like the heat culture thing is like, don't really give the reporters what they want. Kind of just don't say anything. Don't do anything to kind of rock the boat. And Tyler Hero just kind of gave like a half beat pause and was like, I don't not want to feel wanted. Just gave it to him. He's like, You want this? Here it is. Sure. I don't care. It can't True. get worse for me. I've been in trade rumors for two years now. It doesn't matter. He's on Twitter being like, Tyler Hero beating trade rumors again. And he goes, until next summer, like, <laughs> tweets that. that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it, tweeting, like, I'm going to show up to, uh, you know, I can't, I'm going to buy myself a, a Bucks Damian Lillard jersey. And I'm like, dude, wear that to media day. It would be great. He didn't. But I just, I love the attitude because what it says to me, it's not even pettiness, really, maybe a little bit. But it's just like, hey, I'm just going to go out there and hoop. You know, like, just F all this. You know, bleep it all. Like, whatever, man. Whether the Heat want me or not. I just want to play basketball. And and I love that. I think that's a, like a really attractive quality in a basketball player is all I care about is this thing in front of me and just bleep off everything else. Just, I don't even care about it. It doesn't even matter to the point where it's like, it's almost a strength as opposed to a weakness. Because once you, all you do is focus on basketball, then you get a lot better at basketball. And I think that's going to be really interesting. So I'm fascinated by what Tyler Hero season looks like. A Hooper's Hooper with the great sense of fashion, Tyler Hero. Uh, can, can you give me uh, one, one of the young guys you're, you're really excited sure. about? I know it was, it was fun uh, watching Jovic all summer. Yeah. I am just, as a fan of uh, Pac-12 basketball, RIP. I lo- love Jaime Jaquez, but, um, <laughs> but who, who, who are you most excited about? Dang. You're right, man. That's actually kind of depressing that you said that. Um, yeah, about the Pac-12 <laughs> basketball. No, you're right. Like, dude, I got I literally have a John Wooden quote, like, tattooed oh, sure. like, right here. Yeah. So it's like, yo, we're, we're there. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, you already mentioned Jaime and, and Jovic, and so I'm, I'm excited about those two guys, but to, just to give you a different name, uh, could, could be one go, of those two. yeah, but go ahead. 
No, I'm going to go Orlando Robinson. I think people mm. saw the Heat sign Thomas Bryant, and they love Thomas Bryant, and they signed him. Like, okay, there you go. You got your backup center. It's an open competition between Thomas Bryant, who won a championship with the Denver Nuggets last year, and uh, and Orlando Robinson, who maybe a lot of people don't even know who that is. Uh, Fresno State guy, undrafted two years ago, um, or last last summer, really. Um, and then got on with the Heat, two-way contract, played a couple of games for them in the regular season, dominated in the G League for Sioux Falls, uh, and they signed him. And maybe if you do know who Orlando Robinson is, the only reason you know is because, A, you're a diehard basketball fan, and B, is because he had a great summer league and was named to, like, all summer league team or whatever it is that they call that. Um, before he even, like, blew up in Vegas at summer league, the Heat had already promoted him from the two-way contract to the 15-man roster. They love this dude, in other words. They love this guy, and they're really high on him. And so I think Miami's backup center spot, which was a absolute pit, plus minus wise the last couple of years. And in the finals, people might remember this, like Cody Zeller, no disrespect to him would jump in. And then the heat would like, and then the nuggets would go on like a five or six point run. And they'd have to throw bam out of bio in there after like 45 seconds. Like they couldn't, they literally could not afford for bam to come off the floor. Again, I don't know that that would be the case in the final series again, but in the regular season, at least I think they're going to be much stronger at, at their backup center spot. And that should buy bam out of bio some rest minutes. Anyway, I think Orlando Robinson could be really good. You can even see him take some threes this year, which would be interesting. So that's probably the other guy other than Jovic and Hakez. Sue, Sue Falls to Miami has to be the best call up in, in all of sports. <laughs> like that, that is like a light. Hey, you're getting a lifelong pass to Disney World. You get to live there now. And like all your dreams are going to come true. It's like, oh, great, super. But then, and you really don't want to go back. Yeah. So you, you got to play your ass off. I was talking to Orlando on Media Day and he was like, dude, I love Sioux Falls. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I love it, man. I was like, like, what do you do there? He's like, nothing. You just play basketball. I was like, you're, you're crazy, dude. Like you got to do something. And I was like, and I, he's like, okay, well we had this one bar and I was like, all right, there we go. And I was like, and apparently Sioux Falls is a big craft beer place too, which is fun. So I was like, all right, there's gotta be something to do there. But yes, you're right, Gavin, like Sioux Falls. I've been to Sioux Falls. I've seen the arena. There's like a Chili's or something next to it. And like, that's it. And like a one-way street. Like, dude, can you imagine a one-way street going to an NBA or not an NBA necessarily, but a basketball arena in general? Like, no. But in Sioux Falls, you can get away with it. So it's like, it, it, yeah. And then obviously downtown Miami is very different. So yeah. that, that's the beauty of heat culture. It's guys who play in Miami but are fine playing in Sioux Falls. When, like, you, you can right. throw Jimmy Butler there for 80 games and be like, whatever, man. I'm, I'm just here to hoop. Um, <laughs> all right, final thing before we go. Um, what is your, um, you, you kind of gave me like a loose seed range, but what, what, is, your, what is your prediction mm. on what seed Miami will ultimately be? Where do you think they finish in the playoffs? And and final thing for a little bit of spice, uh, what's your predicted record for their season series against the Knicks? They play November 24th at MSG, January 27th at MSG, and April 2nd at Miami. All right. So I think they finish fourth in the East. I don't know why. <laughs> and I'm not really confident in it, but I'm giving you I'm giving you something there. Yeah. Uh, they finish fourth in the East. I don't know who finishes third, but they finish fourth. Um and then in terms of the record and the regular season, the Knicks got the edge last year, 2-1. So I'll go it flips this year. The Heat take the edge, 2-1. And I will, I am tentatively planning on being in that game in MSG on November 24th. I'm really excited about it. Decide that this afternoon, actually. So All right. Hopefully we'll see you there. Wait, so you think yeah. he, he get back to the finals? No? Conference finals? Or you want, you want to save that for your pod? That, that's fine, too. Dude, I've been thinking, I, I don't know, man. Like, I... <laughs> I don't know. Let's save that. Let me we'll, let me we'll give that more thought. We'll, we'll, we'll give people a reason to tune into Locked on Heat. Um, and, and that being said, Wes, where, where can people find um, all your amazing work? Locked on Heat. Um, the YouTube channel's been crushing it. I don't know. What, where do Knicks fans want to just, you're, you're probably just, You don't want like a whole lot of Heat content if you're a Knicks fan. You just you want to like a little, little bit. You, you want to check in every once in a while. Be like, how, check how's in, my check in on so, You know what? Yeah. Follow us on Twitter at Locked on Heat. You get yeah. little doses of what you need there. And on Instagram, our Instagram account is killing it. Locked on Heat on Instagram. Just follow us. Just follow us. You don't need the whole podcast. You're a Knicks fan. You don't want 30 minutes of heat talk. You'll you'll throw up. But just like little like 45 second segments. Follow us on social media. We would love that. I appreciate how how measured and conscientious you were in that plug. <laughs> if, if, if nothing else, throw them a follow just for that. Wes Goldberg, one of the best in the business. Uh, thank you so much for thank you so much for your time, Wes. And uh, we will talk more Knicks, more heat, hopefully sometime yeah. in the playoffs um, soon on Ooh. Locked On Knicks.